If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. Declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com And welcome everybody to the Dan Badani Show on TruthRadioShow.com. And today's video of uh, the Gospel of Mark, we're continuing on to chapter 9. A uh, very in-depth, comprehensive study, guys. So if you missed chapters 1 through 8, please look them up in the playlist here. And we encourage you to start off at the beginning if you haven't watched any of these. But what we do, guys, is we don't just read through the Bible. We stop. We you know, try to understand every word in its context and its key. So anyway, we do a specific Bible study approach. If you don't, you know, haven't been following us already, so we have to constantly recite this here because um, the new listeners and all that. So I apologize and sound redundant all through these videos. Uh, but anyway, we pray for wisdom and understanding. So let's begin with prayer. So, dear Yeshua Messiah, we ask you to forgive us for our sins and our, our trespasses and any abominations, any wrong things we may have committed today. Please forgive us individually for our personal stuff. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, uh, to help us understand your word in full, to send uh, the, the send, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit upon us, to help us teach and understand everything you have to offer in your awesome book of Matthew, I'm sorry, the book of Mark, chapter 9. In your precious name, amen. So after we get pray, done praying, guys, what we do is we read the scripture in its context. Remember this, because most of these false religions out there and ministries and all that, they'll give you a couple verses and they'll jump all over the Bible. You know what I mean? To make it sound like their narrative. What we do here is we don't do any of that, guys. We are strictly biblical here. We're not a religion. Strictly biblical. Follows Jesus Christ in the Word. You know, He's the Word made flesh. So we read the scriptures in this context. Not just a couple of verses. We read it all in this context because context is key. And also, let the scripture interpret the scripture. And as you know, the scripture says, lean not on your own understanding. You know what I mean? So anyway, let's get on with um, Mark chapter 9. So where we left off in chapter 8, it was Jesus uh, once again displaying his awesome power, feeding people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And uh, he now uh, brought to attention to the apostles, hey, listen, I'm going to go into the grave. Okay, they're going to kill me, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, apostles said, well, you know, we'll try to stop you. you know, stop him, I'm sorry, stop the, uh, the enemies from taking you. You know, basically try to thwart because they were concerned about Jesus, you know what I mean? And they knew he came to the earth here to die for our sins, but, you know, they, they love Jesus. So they were like, out of human nature, and now we want to uh, keep you alive. You know, Jesus said, no, this is uh, basically uh, my plan to do this. You know, this is why I'm here. And so this is why Jesus was manifested in the flesh. You know I mean? He was already in the spirit long before creation of the earth. And he didn't just come into existence with Mary. He was here, he was known as the Lord of Spirits and many other names all through history as he appeared to Moses, Enoch, and all these, Jeremiah, uh, Elias, and all these other great prophets along the way. So anyway, um, let's just get on with this here. This is a big chapter, 50 verses, I believe it is. So, um, and he said unto them, Verily I say to you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God with power. Now here, when we talked about preterism before, preterism, if you don't know what that is, guys, it's a, it's a crazy belief that Jesus would turn in 70 AD and all is fulfilled. <laughs> Which we, you know, I mean, all the prophecy, we went through the book of Matthew, right? And Jesus says, uh, sun, moon will go dark, the stars will all fall from heaven. Uh, all these big cataclysmic events that the preterism think this has already happened. So how are we 2022 years later, going on 23 years later, how are we, you know, it makes no sense. There's no historical water to back that up. These prophecies didn't start happening, you know, these major list of prophecies. Israel becoming a nation again, um, all these things going on. They didn't start unfolding to the 1800s. But anyway, the preterism, there's a belief that Jesus returned in 70 AD and all is fulfilled. So this is one of the verses they use to defend themselves. So... And because Jesus says, really, I say to you, that there's some of you standing here which will not taste of death until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, what does that mean? Does that prove preterism? That, you know, because obviously all these people died. You know, everybody's in this uh, context here. They talk about the apostles. Obviously, they've all passed away. They're not still alive. 
because we know Jesus hasn't come back yet. So what does this mean? Well, simply because if you understand this, uh, because yes, they see in the kingdom of God will come with power. Then how do they do that? This is not the return of Jesus. When Jesus will, as we go into our scripture, because it's going to chirp it itself. You'll see for yourself. So what this is talking about, he's telling the apostles there, you're going to see me return. Uh, you know, with the power, you know, the kingdom of God come with power. And they did, did just that. When Jesus resurrected and appeared to them, And, you, you know, plain and simple. It wasn't the two you talked about. This is not talking about his return. As in, uh, all, you know, all evil is going to be banished and everything else. All the prophecies laid out. No. This is talking about, in this, in this context here, it's talking about, and we'll get, you know, as we go along, you'll see what he's talking about. That he's got to return. The kingdom of God with power. Will come with power. So after six days, uh, Jesus take, ta ta I'm sorry, taketh with him Peter, and James and John, and leading them up to a high mountain apart themselves, and he was transfigured. Now, this is also in this context, so, right? So, again, this is, mind you, this is uh, not too soon before his uh, crucifixion, right? So, this is amazing. This really is. This is amazing because this opens up the context for so much interesting investigation. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, so. Again, uh, Jesus took Peter and James and John, took them up to a high mountain, apart themselves, and uh, he was transfigured before them. So which transfigured me? He went from the, uh, the flesh into the spirit. So, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, and has no fuller on the earth can white them. So this is some, uh, yeah, radiant, uh, Jesus became this radiant being. That's what he was, you know, he, before he was in the flesh. He had, you know, when he appeared to these prophets, that's how he appeared to them. So, and there appeared unto them Elias with Moses. Elias is also Elijah, by the way. Elias with Moses, Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Now, here's the thing, right? This brings up another, um, a little uh, study here. So, we understand that the two people that were, if you want to call it rapture, that were caught up with God in the Bible, right? Was Elias and Enoch. The Bible says both of them were taken up to heaven, plain and simple. They didn't, they didn't say face death, they were just taken up to heaven. Now, however, Moses did face death because Satan argued for the body of Moses with the Michael the Archangel. And we ask yourself, well, why would, you, why would Satan want his body? Because my personal belief is. Um, I think Satan would want his body so he could possess it to say he's the return and he's the Messiah to distort the coming of the Messiah. Even though Moses said, you know, specified basically Jesus coming in the future, you know. So this is pretty interesting. Open it up a whole new topic here. Uh, so you're based with uh, Moses. Because again, Elias and um, Enoch were the only two ever in the Bible that we know of that were raptured, if you want to call it that. Like I said, they were taken up by God. They didn't face death. Moses faced death. So, and we understand in the biblical scripture, when people die, what that happens, uh, their body goes into the ground, absolutely, and their souls are in, they're sleeping, right? But in this uh, tent, and the, the scripture mentions that when you get to the, um, to the story about um, Lazarus and, and the rich man, and that they're in Shoal, that's literally in the belly of the earth, it's in the grave. That's when Jesus went when he died, in the grave. Not that he slept for three days. In three nights. No, he went into the grave. And in the grave, it's talking about Sheol. One side of it is hell, the other side is uh, paradise. And no, it's not, nothing to do with purgatory. It's not even the same. Uh, one side of it, and there's a bottomless pit in the middle. And one side is hell, where the wicked go. And one side of it is um, uh, paradise. It's not heaven, but it's paradise. You know what I mean? And what happens is that uh, people, the, the Dead in Christ, that's where they go. And they wait for the resurrection, and they rise from the grave, you know what I mean? So that's what it means by sleeping. It's not that you're actually sleeping, you're in paradise. In the ground, waiting to be resurrected, but you're in this paradise, and the other side is hell. You'll know about this when you read your Lazarus and the rich man, you know what I mean? And it's not just that, it's other parts of the Bible talk about this too. Now, mind you, hell is... Um, Hell is a place, it's like, a, uh, like I mentioned so many other times, hell is like 
a, a, a jail. So you go to jail, right? You go to the court, which would be judgment. And if you're convicted, yet you're going to the big house, prison, right? And that big house is like a lake of fire. Because hell itself is going to the lake of fire, too. So that being said, too, that automatically debunks the entire preterism thing. Because by now, <laughs> 2,000 years later, all the wicked should be in the lake of fire. Which is not you know, true, you know what I mean, right now. Anyway, so this is kind of interesting because... Uh, and I'm sorry to jump all over the place. It's just like there's so much context in here that, you know, it opens up doorways to other investigations and uh, topics, you know. But, and again, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, not to jump, I'm sorry for jumping off the topic, but again, Jesus uh, took Peter, James, and John up to a mountain, and he transfigured, right? And appeared to them was Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. That's very interesting. So when I was mentioning all that stuff here, would I believe that, you know, we, we understand Elijah and Enoch were the only two that were raptured, if you will, right, but to God, took it up with our face of death. We know Moses did face death, but here's the thing. This also proves, because there's people out there who believe when you die, you don't do nothing. You just sit there, you're asleep. You have no conscience of what's going on, which the Bible says you have no conscience of what's going on on the earth, on the earth. But you do go do, do a place called Paradise. I hope you all go there. Not hell, you know what I mean? So your soul goes somewhere. It's not just uh, in limbo, you know what I mean? Your soul goes somewhere, the uh, paradise or hell, no in between, whatever. And Moses, obviously, either God took his soul right away. Uh, that could be open up for a debate or discussion, whatever. But, um, obviously, the thing is, Moses was in deep sleep because why would, how would Moses be in the spirit, standing there with Elijah, Talking to Jesus. How would that be possible? Because something here is going on here that Moses is in the spirit. Thousands of years after he faced his uh, earthly death. Right? So, yeah, it's a very interesting topic here. Yeah, we're going to do a study on that. But anyway, and uh, Peter answered to, and said to Jesus, Master, isn't it good for us to be here? And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. So, uh, for he wished not to say, for they were so afraid. So, the apostles, imagine you standing there, you see Jesus transfigured into the, to the spirit, right? Then you see, uh, this, and now mind you, this is probably actually the first time that the apostles seen Moses and Elijah in the spirit. And mind you, Moses and Elijah lived thousands of years before this, right, in the earth. On the other side. So, yeah, so they're like, wow. And they were afraid. Like, wow, this is like, not just standard, the, mag the magnitude of this. Especially the Jesus and the raiment of light and everything else. It's crazy. Really awesome stuff. And there was a cloud uh, that overshadowed them and voice that came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. This is the voice of God. I have a father. And suddenly they were had looked around about and saw no man and, and not anyone. And save Jesus sat with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should not tell no man what things they had seen until the Son of Man was risen from the dead. This is after the resurrection. Don't tell anybody to after I rose from the death. Dead, the, the, the resurrection. And they kept that saying with, to themselves, questioning one with another, uh, what rising from the dead should mean. So they asked, like, oh, wow, it's rising from the dead. What does this mean? Yeah, and they asked them, saying, what, why say that the scribes that Elias must have come first? And he answered and told them, Elias verily comes first and restored all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be uh, not. Because remember, Elias was uh, prophesied the coming of Jesus. But I say unto you, Elias is indeed come. He's already come. And they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. So this brings up another thing, too. And please forgive me for sound redundant from prior videos there. But, you know, the modern day churches tell you to read Matthew through Revelation. The Old Testament doesn't matter, blah, 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 right? This is modern day dispensationalism, right? So, how we. I think I mentioned this in the last chapter. Sorry to repeat myself, but this is important. So, as it is written, how many times has Jesus said, as it is written? Talking about what, the Torah of the Old Testament? The book of Daniel or whatever? Yeah. 
How would you know, if you don't know the Old Testament, how would you know what he's talking about? Why would he mention the Old Testament if it's not relevant? It is relevant. So regardless of these uh, modern day churches, oh, just read Matthew through Revelation. No, you need to read Genesis through Revelation. Because you're not going to know anything but Jesus is talking about unless you know the Old Testament. You can't know the Old New Testament until you know the Old. Plain and simple. So when he came to his disciples and saw a great multitude about them, good, you know, thousands of people, and the scribes questioned him with them. And straight away, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and went into a salute him. So in other words, there was a hello. You know, a salute him means acknowledging him. And mind you, the scribes are there too. And he asked the scribes, what question ye had with them? So Jesus automatically knew the scribes were there only to ask him questions. And again, the scribes were always out there, the scribes, the elders, well, or they were constantly asking Jesus uh, questions to try and incrim incriminate him uh, to get him to commit blasphemy. The scribes from day one were out to like, dis disable Jesus, basically. Come up with something so they could put him to death. I mean, granted, they wanted to kill him from day one, but they knew if they did, because Jesus had such a popular following, yeah, that would be the end of them too. You know what I mean? So they had to come up with something to, for you know, for the so-called Jesus to violate their law, you know, commit blasphemy or whatever. So, you know, Jesus says, what, what questions do you have? And one of the multitudes answered and said, Master, I have brought up unto them my son, which had a dumb spirit. So another possessed kid here. And whoever uh, he taketh him, uh, he teareth him and there foameth and gnashing with his teeth. So basically he's saying like, um, yeah, <laughs> the spirit overtook him and it's making him uh, tearing up and foaming at the mouth and just going with his teeth and uh, pineth away. And I spake to the disciples and they should uh, cast him out and they could not. So basically, um, remember this? Remember this here? Okay. And this is one of the tr proofs here because of the Catholic Church, right? I love this, these books because they just derail all these religions. The faith of Jesus is not a religion. We don't follow any religion. Now it's derailing the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church thought, because we just read in the prior chapters, that Jesus gave the apostles power to forgive sin, authority to forgive sin, power to cast out demons, this, that, and the other thing, right? So the Catholic Church believes that they had these powers and they gave them to uh, priests later on and so on and today they justify this as the Catholic priests have the, been the Pope has the ability to forgive people of sin and all that stuff. No, they don't. That's not what happened. That's not even close to being true. So here and I mentioned this too, they, were, they weren't given these powers temporary and here's proof right there because this is after the fact, right? And they only get, and Jesus only gave them authority and power for a short time, because the thing is, all these multitudes of people everywhere, uh, he had to go to certain lands to spread the gospel. So if, instead of him and the, the apostles going to one place at a time, he had them go two by two. He had uh, 12 apostles split up into six different locations, and he took the seventh location and kept doing that to spread the gospel even more and help people, heal them and everything else. But that was only for a short time. The apostles didn't have these powers forever. Now, granted, today they have had the power to cast out demons and all that stuff, yeah. But, you know, then this here, uh, we do too. But this here, well, the thing is they had ultimate power that Jesus gave them for a short time. Now, this here is proof that they didn't have this power because now they couldn't cast this demon out. Because this person come up to him and say, Hey, Master, I have a son now with a dumb spirit. Um, and he's described what's going on with the son, right? And they said, I went to your disciples and they couldn't cast him out. So this right here debunks that whole Catholic thing. You know, so at this point, the apostles don't have the power to do this. And Jesus said to him, O oh, uh, Seth, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I stuff you bring them unto me? Talk about the apostles, though. You know what I mean? Like, and that thing is, like, they were, they, the powers were taken away from them, but they still could cast out demons by faith. We can do that ourselves, guys. We're not given power, but we're given power through Jesus Christ, not ourselves. The Catholic Church believes that they have power through themselves. No, they don't. Because if they had that power, they wouldn't have this problem right now. Now it's by faith, because Jesus called his apostles faithless. How long do I got to be with you? 
You know, you know what I mean? Plain and simple. All the stuff you see me doing, you don't have faith to cast out a demon. Anyway, and they brought him unto him, the kid unto him, the possessed kid. And when they saw him, straight away the spirits tear him, and they fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. So right away, like uh, they brought this possessed kid to him, and they see they seen Jesus, the it dropped to its knees on the ground, his hands and face, whatever, wallowing foaming on the, at the mouth and all that. And he asked of his father, asked the father, how long is it since the, this came into him? How long has your child been possessed? He said, basically. And oftentimes he had cast him into the fire and into the water and to destroy him. But those cannot uh, do anything. Have compassion on us and help us. So Jesus said unto him, If thou can't believe, all these things are possible to him to believe. So he asks him a question, he gives him a story. And it's like, well, you just believe. Believe and, you know what I mean, plain and simple. Have faith. So anyway, and uh, straight away the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So he's a man like, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't believe. You know what I mean? And uh, please help me. And Jesus saw this compassion, you know, and then when Jesus saw the people come one uh, together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Though dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Boom, just like that. And a spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was uh, was as one dead, insomuch as they said, he is dead. So basically... Jesus cast a spirit right out of him. So now the body just drops, okay? People think his son is dead now. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So this, this just demonstrates the amazing power of Jesus. It's, it's really awesome. And so everybody just, like, thinks he's, yeah, the kid's dead, and Jesus uh, just grabbed him. Yeah, and then Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and said he arose. And when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, what, why could we not cast him out? See, again, this right here, if they can cast him out just like that, right, that shows you, and that debunks the whole Catholic thing that the apostles always had these powers and the authority, right? And again, they had it for a while, and it was only temporary. And now it's not contradicting to what I was saying earlier about we all have the power to do this. You don't have to be a priest or anything else like that. That wasn't what it's talking about. And so the Catholic Church thinks the apostles had full authority and power to forgive sins, this, that, and the other, thing, everything that Jesus could do, right? Heal people and all that. No. The healing stopped. Okay, yeah, we can still cast out demons. The healing stopped and the, uh, the ability, the authority to forgive people's sins, that stopped. That was only for a short time. Because if, the, if, if not, why was, this is uh, not too soon after the apostles had this power to do this, right? It was in the last couple of chapters, right? So if that was the case, how, you know, because this would be contradicting them. It's not contradicting because they they couldn't do it. They had the, they didn't have the power, the authority, and all that. You know what I mean? And they they could have yes, they, they could have cast this demon out absolutely using faith. But I guess they had uh, the power and they just did it without having faith. You know what I mean? And I don't hope I make a, a lot of sense to you guys because um, this is very critical because it's with the Catholic Church we use to defend their stance on popes and priests and all that stuff, and they have the power to do this. No, they don't. Or the authority. No, they don't. So right here shows that the apostles didn't have this ability no more. Now it's by faith. And, they, you know, tch. yeah. So they came into the house, and the disciples asked him uh, privately, hey, why, why couldn't we cast the, the, him out, the demon? And he said unto him, the, um, this kind of, they come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. See? And he said to them, this kind cannot come forth by nothing, right? Because you had the power and authority to do that before. But and now it's for prayer and fasting. So you out there listening right now, if you need to, um, you know, confront one of these demons or help somebody, right? You can do this by praying and fasting. That's not just limited to the apostles or a priest or anything like that. That's anybody. Prayer, now you're saying to them, you, you, know, you have to conduct prayer and fasting. And uh, they departed, hence they passed through Galilee, and he said, 
would not that any man should know this. So to keep this quiet for a while, well, you know what I mean? And the thing is, he kept telling people to keep these things quiet for a while until after his resurrection and all that, because uh, so they could write books, whatever the case, and, uh, you know, get, get the stuff on record, you know? And also because, like, <laughs> his popularity was so big, you know what I mean? And everywhere he went, there was, like, just thousands of people asking for help and all that. And it's, like, almost, only so much that they could do, you know? Anyway, because you know, they spent days healing people. In verse 31, for he uh, taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that, as he is killed, he shall rise on the third day. So this is Jesus telling the apostles, right? He's the Son of Man referring to himself. He says, they're going to come deliver me into their hands. Okay, They're going to come capture me. They're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise on the third day which is three days and three nights later. They specifies that later. But they understood not saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So they, they kind of, like, like this is saying, they, kind of, they didn't understand what he's saying. But they were afraid to ask him details about that. And he came into Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, why was it that ye disputed among yourselves, by the way? So, because Jesus knew what they were thinking and saying. You know what I mean? And um, they held their peace uh, for the way they had disputed among themselves who shouldn't be the greatest. Who should be the greatest, I'm sorry, right? And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. So basically, if you want to be number one top honcho and all that stuff, yeah, you got to be ranked number last. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what's going on. You know what I mean? you got to be humble and all that stuff. You know, not to dissolve, oh, I'm going to be the leader and all that, you know. And that's, it goes more about this. Uh, and he took a child and set them in the midst of them. And when he had taken his, his, in his arms, he asked them, to, to them. So this is pretty cool. He took, it was a child, and he took the child, held the child in his arms, and he said unto them, Whoever shall receive one such children in thy name receiveth me. And whoever shall receiveth me receiveth not me. But him that sent me, the Father. I love how Jesus always uses children, like because of uh, the perfect demonstration of how he wants us to be, like children, right? So, and John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us, and he forbid him uh, because he follows not us. And Jesus told him, So, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak of evil of me. So basically saying that anybody that does these things, they're not of me, plain and simple. They can't be, uh, I'm sorry, they can't do these things unless they're of me, you know? And for he that is not against us is on a part. So for whoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because it belongs, ye belong to Christ, Verily I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So if they give you something in his name, okay, it's, it, belong, it belongs to Christ. And he shall not lose his reward. And whoever shall offend one of these, this is very powerful, yeah. Whoever shall, and mind you, still got the kingdom thumbs. And whoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. This is very powerful. If you understand the magnitude of this, right? And this goes a long way. This goes a long, 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 long way. Uh, this is uh, people who abuse children, do unspeakable things to children, uh, just harm children anyway, physical, mentally, spiritually, any which way possible. And what, what does this mean? Cat, cat, uh, put a, hang a millstone around his neck and cast him to the sea? Because here's the thing, right? Uh, even to this day, the most fearful death, we took a survey, What's your most fearful death? Most people would probably say drowning. That's a lot of people's fears, right? So basically the most horrific death you can face, right? Imagine a millstone. This thing weighs like a couple tons. This is a huge foundation stone. Imagine that being tied around your neck, right, and kicked off the boat and you going, you going with it, plain and simple, right to the bottom of the drink. Imagine the fear of that, like you're in there and you're drowning. Yeah. <laughs> So basically he's saying it's better for you to face, <laughs> it would be better for you to face your most horrific death 
than to meet the face of the Father. That's exactly what they're saying for misleading children. So all those evil people out there, I would repent right now, and God will forgive you. Talk about people who like uh, just abort kids because they like to, whatever the case, uh, you know, do all this horrific stuff to children. This would, you know, <laughs> you have no idea the consequences you got to face the Father for if you don't repent right now. And uh, this is very severe. When it comes to children, you are playing with hellfire and then some. All you're doing is um, putting an investment down in a piece of real estate in the lake of fire after the judgment. That's what you're doing. And again, anything spiritually, physically, mentally, you harm children. Yeah, this is, the lake of fire is coming. Not hell, but the lake of fire. It's coming hell, hard for you. And Jesus goes on to say, and if you, your hand offends you, cut it off. For it is better to enter the, into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. And yeah, the, this is the other thing too. You know, when I mentioned hell and the lake of fire and all that, and people, there's uh, like uh, the Jehovah Witnesses. I love these books, man, because they destroy these religions. Jehovah Witnesses, uh, Mormons, uh, Catholic Church, Islam, the Muslim religion, the pre-tourism people. Uh, th these books just eradicate it when you read it in this context. Because uh, the Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in hell. They believe when you die, you just die like that. So if that's the case, well, what does that even mean? Or well, it's figuratively, they say. No, it's not figurative. It's uh, hell. The Bible makes it very clear that it's like a fire after that, after judgment. Hell's in the grave, guys. The bad people in the, who go to, who die right now go to hell. The good people who die right now go to paradise. And no, it's not the same thing as purgatory, like I said. The Bible makes this very clear. You sleep. Hey, you know, the, sleep, the dead in Christ go to paradise. The, the wicked, the dead wicked go to hell. And he goes on, right? He says, uh, if your hand, cut, you know, your right hand, uh, your hand, whatever the case, offends you, cut it off. And you know, it's better to enter into heaven, into life, the second life, than having two hands to go into hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. And he goes on and says, where the worms dieth not and the fire is not quenched. This is a perfect description of hell right there. If it's figuratively or it doesn't exist, why do we go into details then? Oops. Why would he go into those details like that? Again, uh, in hell, like, into the fire that shall never be quenched, and where the worms die not, and the fire is quenched. Not, well, never quenched, I'm sorry. Everlasting fire, and the worms just eat at you. And he goes on to say, if your foot offends you, cut it off. It is better to enter the hall into life than to receive two feet and be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worms dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Again, describing it. So, you know, it's kind of weird for something that's figuratively, right? Or something that doesn't exist to some religions. Why would he be warning you about that and giving you details about hell? Yeah. Because it's not figurative, it's literally. He goes, well, it's parables, and uh, it's not really talked about. Yeah, no. Jesus talked in parables only uh, to, so you could understand what he's talking about. But he, he's describing hell in detail. Hell's a real place. And if thy eye offend you, pluck it out, for it is better to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell for you. Where the worms dieth not and the fire is not quench. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltness, where will be the, the season of it? Have salt in your, uh, yourselves and have peace with one another. So basically, you just say you get this bland piece of meat, right? You're eating, and there's no salt. Just, ugh. You spit it out, probably, right? Yeah, whatever. We're supposed to be the light and salt of the earth, guys. And um, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or not. If you're not, like, producing light and salt, you know what I mean? What good are you? You're going to be called a lukewarm Christian. And he says in the scriptures, you're going to be chewed up and spit out. 
Talk to the believers, you know what I mean? Let your light shine, let your salt be uh, salted, you know what I mean? And uh, this is pretty cool. But uh, anyway, he perfectly describes hell. And it's not the only place here. I mean, <laughs> many other places he talks about hell. All right, this uh, fiery place, you know, again, where the worms don't die and the fire is never quenched. And he says, everybody's going to be, shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. But the salt is good, but the salt has lost its, but if the salt has lost its flavor, where with will be the seasoning? So it's not going to be seasoned. Then have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Have salt in yourselves. In other words, spread the gospel. Do something for the Lord. Plain and simple. So this is a pretty interesting chapter. Fifty verses here, and we learned a lot. And uh, we hey, this chapter alone, we just uh, debunked the preterism. We just debunked the Catholic Church and uh, the Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> this is amazing. That's why I love uh, Matthew Mark here. It's just like it's such amazing books. So anyway, guys, uh, thank you all for joining us. This is a very interesting subject here. So um, trust the real plan, guys, and that's the Bible, plain and simple. And uh, don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody else's word for it. Don't take the pastor's word for it. Don't take uh, the guys on ICTV's word for it, or myself or Brian or anybody else, guys. Read it for yourself, plain and simple. And that's exactly what um, John Hall and all them say, too. Read it for yourselves. And I got to, actually got this from John Hall. Now this here, and also this uh, John Hall. Uh, I love John Hall and Patricia on their remnant restoration. The catch them guys, awesome show. They're on Mondays now. So uh, if you want to subscribe to Nice TV's network, guys, um, please follow them. All the links are in the description. Also, if you want to join their page description, uh, Dan demands a promo code, and it's nystv.org, and uh, the instructions are in the description. So you get 30 days free on me. Dan demands a promo code, and trust me, you are not going to want to unsubscribe. Awesome videos, thousands of videos, documentaries, and everything else you cannot see on YouTube because of YouTube and other platforms. Uh, they don't allow uh, real truth, you know. So, and, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time before they're going to shut us down here. So, we ask you to support our website at truthradioshow.com where you'll find the links to our spiritual warfare shows, our news shows, uh, special reports, and things like this. Yeah, uh, talk about the Bible. So, thank you for tuning in to this awesome comprehensive study of the book of Matthew, of Mark, I'm sorry, I keep saying Matthew, I just got done with Matthew, but the book of Mark, chapter 9. So as Dan Bedondi, God bless, Shalom, and you are the resistance.